Hello and welcome to the Home Business of Podcast. My name is Phil. Joining me as usual, I've got Rohan. Hello. Hey. And today, another person from North America, we've got John joining us. Hey, John. Howdy. This episode is sponsored by Home Assistant Cloud by Nabucasa. Easily and securely access your local Home Assistant instance remotely for a small monthly fee that also supports the Home Assistant project. The configuration is done by the user interface, so there's no fiddling with router settings, SSL certificates, or any YAML. Whereabouts in the world, or whereabouts in the States, are you from, John? Right now, I'm on the Gulf Coast, Mississippi, in Biloxi. All right, well, we've got some cool stuff to talk about with you in a minute with your Home Assistant setup, but first, Rohan, should we call ourselves the Home Assistant Core podcast, do you think? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so... if. <laughs> So if you're not sure what uh, Phil's alluding to, there were some new naming changes at Home Assistant. That's right. Yeah. So a couple of weeks ago, or as of a couple of weeks ago, Home Assistant, uh, they're going to rename some stuff just to make make it easier for uh, folks to figure out what they're installing or, you know, it makes the whole support process easier, so on and so forth. I actually moved a customer from Hass over to Hassio. And her reaction was, what is Hasio? And so now I don't have to worry about <laughs> yeah, those ex- conversations. Exactly, exactly. So that that's the problem it's trying to solve. Probably in the short term, I suspect it's going to make things a little bit complicated uh, until kind of everybody catches up with the whole naming. So Hasio is now going to be called Home Assistant. Home Assistant will be called Home Assistant Core. And HasOS will stay HasOS. So... Now, when you hear Home Assistant, it's really referring to Has.io. I like that because I have used both. And uh, while I think Home Assistant Core is a great starting point, particularly if you're already a programmer and you really want to understand the uh, trial by fire learning curve and know all the nuts and bolts, then that's a great starting point. But really, Has.io is the easier, more capable launch point for you know, for entry level users like myself and below. So uh, I, I like the name change. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's not bad. I, j- I just think it's going to be a little bit confusing for a little bit. Yeah, I think um, uh, they've said it's going to take a couple of weeks for them. They're going to have to go through, update all the repositories, you know, basically do a global find and replace wherever where, you know, how I always mentioned and update it. I think in the Long term, it makes sense, uh, especially as we move towards that version 1.0 and we want, you know, it to become more user friendly for everyone. The only thing I am a bit concerned about is Hasselio add ons and, you know, sort of search engine optimization and Mm. all that. You know, right now, I think all the YouTube videos that all those YouTubers have created, all the, uh, all Frank's uh, add ons that he's made, because remember, he's the add on store. Are all Hasio, and that's what all the keywords are related to. So, I think in the short term, it may have a little bit of a, a negative impact with people getting confused. But moving forward, I think it's a, a good move. Yeah. No. At, at first, it's interesting. At first, when I read the uh, when I read the blog article that was posted on uh, the Home Assistant website, I was kind of like, uh, okay, this seems kind of silly. But then, you know, thinking about it a little bit, reading it, uh, reading it again. I agree with you, Phil. I think I think long term it does make more sense, but short term I think it's going to be a little painful. All right. Well, that means we have a new release to talk about, which is zero point one hundred five, and a lot of new uh, user interface tweaks have come out in this release, and a massive uh, UI change for the configuration area has been done. It looks so much nicer now. There's nice icons in there. There's also a brand new zone editor. So you can actually go in, get a map. You can edit the zones, put in the Latin long, put in the radius. It looks very sick. Mm -hmm. To add to that, there's also a SiteHound integration now. So SiteHound uh, basically is a service. They offer a cloud API for developers to scan images for objects. So what that means is Home Assistant can now send an image to the SiteHound API and you'll basically get a sensor value with the number of people detected in that image. So it's basically image processing that you can do. So um, I, I'm I'm interested personally. I'm interested to see what uh, people are doing with uh, obviously camera feeds. That I think that's a low hanging fruit here, but camera feeds and such with uh, with Home Assistant and SiteHound integration. So I think this will be cool for like I have my Ring video camera that 
with home uh, when movement yeah. is detected, it captures the latest image. I can then push that off now to Sighthound and then it'll detect, you know, was there a person in that image? And if so, maybe alert me as opposed to just alerting me all the time whenever the wind blows and a, a leaf blows in front of the camera. Yeah. The only thing, I, I mean, I don't, I personally don't know enough about Sighthound, but uh, what I'm curious about is uh, to see, you know, is this going to be a process to take a video and convert it to an image and then send the image across? Or is there going to be some quick and easy way to pull that across? Or, you know, even with, because I believe the ring integration, like you said, Phil, basically is a GIF that uh, that gets generated. So I, I don't know how that's going to work. The ring I'm, does a, a JPEG image of like the latest. So you can get, there's, you can get the latest video and then you can get a, a JPEG like of a still frame of what just happened. The site had integration will only accept a, an image. It won't right. accept a whole video feed. Exactly. So it'll be interesting to see how uh, people take, you know, whether it's videos or what, and maybe select a specific frame and then do that. So, yeah. If you want to play around with it, they actually have a, a live demo on their website. I played around with it today. Uh, just oh, cool. don't be too uh, harsh on yourself when it says that you don't look very happy in a photo that you've uploaded or you look 50 years old and you're really 20 years younger. So <laughs> just be just be careful with that one. Uh, another no, new platform that's come out, sorry, another new integration that's being released in this version is the Gamu local SMS notifications. So if your local telcos still provide GSM modems or you have a USB GSM modem that you can hook up into Home Assistant, you can now send SMS notifications and you don't need a, an internet connection. So a lot of SMS notification integrations in Home Assistant currently require a API call via the internet. So this will be good if you're mm-hmm. got a, a moving house or you're out somewhere that doesn't have internet connection and want to send SMS notifications. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really great. Also, we got a uh, template alarm panel. So now you can actually create an alarm panel using template values. So if you want to create, uh, if you don't have a security system or MQTT and want to create an, an alarm panel in Home Assistant, there you go. That's awesome. I'll move mine out of MQTT finally. Uh, lots of breaking <laughs> changes once again in 0105. We've got a couple of here that are pretty important. First of all, Samsung TVs have now moved to a config flow. Uh, and they've also removed the options for MAC address and a broadcast address. So there's been a new uh, turn-on service, which has been added as part of that config flow, which will basically allow you to do some more custom stuff if you have a, a certain way that you want to turn on your Samsung TV. Yeah, interesting. Well, with that too, there's a Spotify integration uh, that Home Assistant has, which has been rewritten a little bit. So the play the playlist service has been removed. So, you know, this might break some stuff if you use this today. So just make sure you check out your config and up to, uh, update it before you upgrade to 105. Yeah, I just upgraded as well. And I think if you still have Spotify in your YAML files, it is going to just issue that little warning in your, as you start up home system mm-hmm. to remove it out of there. So be sure to do that too. Uh, and a lot of... Deprecated features have been announced uh, in this release. So these will be removed in 0107 and they're all to do with the old states UI. For example, hide entities option against automations is now being deprecated. The group services for the states UI is gone. Uh, The web link component is being removed and the hide if away in device trackers is also gone and the history graph integration. They're all being deprecated, so they'll be removed in 0107. If you are using Lovelace, you shouldn't really be affected by these, but if you've been a long-time Home Assistant user, you may have some stuff still hanging around in your YAML files. I know I definitely will, so you will need to remove those. They should raise warnings in your Home Assistant log as you reboot. Uh, but Rahan, I want to get your opinion on this. I, was, I found it interesting that they've gone ahead and remove or marked a lot of these stuff uh, as deprecated from Mm -hmm. and this is all like states ui stuff but do you think that it's a bit harsh on people that maybe not moved over to lovelace you know we're sort of home assistant is now saying yes we still support states ui if you really want to use it but on the other hand they're now taking features away that were available for states ui users yes so it's one of those things right again it's the idea is I'm guessing the idea is 
how do we reduce the image size? How do we reduce, you, you know, make, make actually like the Home Assistant core software more efficient, lean? stable, yeah. lean? Yeah, exactly. So again, it's one of those things where I, I, I do understand why features get deprecated, especially less used features. Um, and, and I guess this is also kind of where it comes, uh, comes in handy because there's that, uh, built in, uh, what's it called? This is, this is the reporting, not the reporting engine, the built in engine that basically sends information about your home assistant usage back to the home assistant devs. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I know a lot of times, and, and I mean, I think, Phil, we've talked about uh, we've talked about this to a couple of developers uh, of Home Assistant, and you know they do look at that information as in you know, before deprecating a feature, so on and so forth. What do they actually? What do people actually use? Right now, with that said, I'm not sure if these are some of those features that you know they get insight into or not. But I think I think it's again, I I, I never like the removal of functionality, but I but I do understand why they have to do it. Yeah, um, I get that. And like you said, Lovelace is, I mean, Lovelace has been the primary UI for a while now. So uh, I, I, I get it, right? This is what I'm trying to say, I think. Um, yeah. But I do see why it can be frustrating if if you use, uh, if you, or sorry, if you don't use Lovelace. Makes sense. I don't even know how you wouldn't use Lovelace at this point. So <laughs> it doesn't really impact new users. If you're, yeah. yeah, if you are a new user, you shouldn't really be even knowing what the state's UI is or where it is. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, again, I'm not, I'm not, personally, I'm not torn about it, but I could see why someone who uses it would be. All right. So, some other noteworthy updates. Um, Doorbird events are now added to Home Assistant logs. Um, so, I guess that wasn't there before. Um, well, yeah, I used Doorbird, and uh, I was unaware of that missing feature, um, it seems to work great for me. I'm actually surprised it doesn't get mentioned more often as a doorbell solution. Yeah. I guess it's a little pricey. Yeah, that's interesting. So, so what, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on this a little bit later, but, uh, just so everyone knows, the doorbird is a, um, sort of ring like solution, right? Or a nest doorbell like yeah. solution. Yeah, it's, it's a higher end, I'd say. It's, uh, you know, when you get into like architectural grade doorbells, they have a lot to offer. Um, and they do have a, a lower end residential, but they don't do subscription fees. And so their products tend to be a little bit higher up front. And uh, while they do have like a cloud service associated with it, it is geared towards uh, local, um, local webhook uh, commands. Mm hmm. And uh, and I don't know, it works very reliably in my experience, but it will give you remote uh, notifications when you're away from your home as well, like a commercial doorbell should. Right. What, right. what I like about Do Doorbird is they just make doorbells. So, you know, if they go out of business, it's because they failed at making a good doorbell, not because they've chosen to like retire it as a product in their product portfolio. Sure, sure, sure. That's, right. That's a good way to look at it. I like that. Uh, and also, if you are a user of Mary Text-to-Speech, which is a locally hosted text-to-speech service, as of 0 0.105, you can also uh, use effects in your text-to-speech. So I think the local service has things maybe like birds chirping or a chime or something. You can now include that as part of your little text-to-speech notification. Reminds me similar, I don't know, Rohan, if you use the uh, the Amazon Echo announce feature. So you could say, you know, hey, Echo, announce yep. to the house, you know, dinner's ready. I've noticed that depending on what you say, like if you say dinner's ready, she'll play a little cowbell to say, you know, dinner's ready, you know, ding, 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 sort of thing. <laughs> Have you noticed that? <laughs> no? I, I, haven't, I haven't done that one myself, but that's, uh, I, I have noticed it with other ones. I'm just trying to think of which ones. Um I know exactly what you're saying, so... Yeah, so I'm, I'm guessing you can sort of do that now with Mary TTS. It might be a good local hosted TTS replacement for you. Yeah, yeah. All right, so, so John, this is kind of where we start talking about you. All right. So, I mean, let's jump, just, let's jump right into it. Um, how long have you been using Home Assistant? Well, I actually, I started with Home Assistant maybe two years ago, uh, trying to make an energy controller... Mm -hmm. And uh, I was at the time I was looking at like infrared controllers because they were 
you know, five dollars each and could plug into your wall and it made a nice Raspberry Pi project. And I wasn't really sure if I was going with Home Assistant or, you know, another kind of Raspberry Pi project with this infrared controller built on top of it. And so I threw it all in and realized, you know, Home Assistant is some decent control software and got it up and running. And then it w didn't work as well as I thought it would. The infrared signals would get mixed up. And so I kind of set it on the shelf for a while. And then lately I've come back to Home Assistant. It was, it was, I'm a solar contractor. And right. so I was building an off grid uh, home, large home, 5,000 square feet, uh, mostly all electric. They have a gas stove top and that's it. Um, and they, they were looking at a control for home automation solution, but it was outside of the, the budget range, you know, control right. for it. Yeah. I was looking at it and it's like, wow, that's a, yeah. you know, that's a home on assistant, you know, home automation budget that anyone doing home on assistant would be very, um, envious of. And it's like, well, can't we do, can't we start doing this, you know, a little bit more, um, cheaply and maybe a little bit more funk, you know, functionally. Cause it looked to me like control four was kind of like the gas automobile of, uh, home automation, you know, very hardwired solution. And I thought, well, maybe with, with, uh, you know, more of a digital automation approach, we could start providing some of the same features, but not necessarily at the installation costs that control four recommended right. i don't know if that went went completely to plan you know it, it turns out that a lot of the the stuff that the the client thought was home automation is not what i would think you know being a home automation enthusiast would be more mm -hmm. like how to get the cable boxes to each room in the house rather than use a smart television um but it was it was a really interesting approach because i think most people come into their first you know, home assistant build doing something small. And, uh, I ended up, you know, pulling a half a mile of ethernet through this house and, uh, you know, doing a rather large build. And so it was more of a trial by fire. And, and since then on my own home automation, home on home assistant build, I've done something much more small. I'm running off a, instead of doing a build server, you know, I'm running off a of raspberry Pi and, uh, making things a lot more simple around the home rather than go through a, you know, luxury whole house. Build. Yeah. So, yeah. I have about maybe a year of solid home assistant under my belt at this point. Okay. That's not bad. So for that house, was you, were you like the, uh, so you were obviously the contractor or the business out there installing a home assistant into this customer's house. Is that what you did? Yeah, that's, that's what I did. And, um, uh, what was nice, I, I heavily used, relied upon the Discord group for help. You know, there's plenty of power yeah. users on that Discord group who provided a tremendous amount of advice uh, for them. And also there's a, another Discord group, Build Servers, that, uh, you know, helped me with building the, the home server for the, for the house as well. And so I think the two kind of married each other to make a real nice technical support community for getting this kind of build established especially because you know i'm i did minor computer repair in say college but i'm not you know someone who's out there building computers or servers on a day-to-day -day basis it was pretty far outside my comfort range i'd never crimped an ethernet cable before attempting this <laughs> build and you know we had i bet you're an expert ethernet now Ethernet runs and <laughs> yeah <laughs> And an expert on what not to do as well as what to do. That's right. So how do you go about managing uh, home assistant upgrades for that house now? Is that completely the house owner's responsibility? Or do you have like a, a service contract that you have to do for that? Well, the, the homeowner was a computer scientist. So I'm not too concerned about uh, providing additional technical support, although we're still transitioning that. Um, and that was part of you know, discovering that, hey, actually, we need to migrate her over to, to I guess, formerly Hasio to, to provide better, you know, backup and support and servicing. But mm -hmm. Nabucasa, you know, I can just remote log in and make some changes to automations and code and uh, log back out. It's actually a little bit easier to service than what I anticipated. That's awesome. I think you're probably the first person we've seen really, you know, use Home Assistant in a commercial setting like that. So that's really cool to yeah. hear. 
Well, I, you know, one thing about the name change to me with my uh, kind of tongue in cheek is I'm actually looking at some commercial applications of Home Assistant. And so I have to explain to business owners, oh, yeah, it's called Home Assistant, but actually you have some really great value for your commercial buildings. So just ignore the yeah. residential aspect because this can be a, you know, implemented at the commercial level as well. But it, it turns out that the energy controls, you know, that's what I started looking into Home Assistant for. And then kind of where even in my own personal build, that that was where I think there was a lot of value for it. And, you know, being in the solar industry, I've worked in solar for 10 years, but I'm I'm an apartment owner and I rent. And so I don't you know, have ownership in a solar mm-hmm. array. But what mm-hmm. I really like about Home Assistant is... You know, it's very easy to uh, spend all the pocket change in your wallet on, you know, how am I going to upgrade my my home assistant build this month? You know, where can I put thirty dollars to tinker around with it? Right, right. And uh, and and you know, with the energy controls, that's you know, I'm saving about that much each month off my electric bill, and so you know, I've kind of created my own budget to pay for things like. Navu Casa cloud subscription and and my my home addiction habit. <laughs> That's great. Um, do you have any um, voice or do you use tablets or anything or how do you how do you drive home assistant? Yeah, so you know we're at home on a just I kind of pulled together spare parts out of my uh, closet, so I dusted off the Raspberry Pi three. And, uh, you know, I have some, you know, AOTech devices, right. uh, you know, uh, the AOTech energy meter is, is I combine that with a Z-Wave plus thermostat. And so like, you know, Nest is a thermostat and Sense is an energy meter. And what I do with my company level is builds that are focused on uh, combining a thermostat and an energy meter. So not necessarily using those products, but by going with Z-Wave Plus, uh, you can have similar values and and keep it on a local Z-Wave network at a lower price point. And, you know, there's there's a reason why Nest came to market first, and it does offer, you know, energy savings. And so kind of what I'm focused on is, you know, I know how to do the high-end whole house you know, luxury yeah. builds. But I think that, you know, if we want, you know, Home Assistant to be a standard home automation platform like HomeKit or Smart Things or other hubs, you know, a, a good focus is on payback. And so if if we don't try and shoot the moon uh, with a first venture into smart home tech, but if you can do a, a $500 build that reduces your electric bill by 30 or 40 dollars a month i think that could be a very popular entry point into this system you know not just for tinkerers but friends and family members of tinkerers that the uh that we would like to see using this platform yeah yeah that's what i'm kind of uh working on putting together at level uh as kind of my professional venture into home assistant very cool so i'm guessing you're trying to combine the sensors that you would get for example you know you mentioned before the aotech energy monitors so you might plug that into a heater and then you would know okay if this is how much the heater is costing based on how much energy is being consumed and then try and work out how much to save from there. Well, it's it's a little bit more than that. So I think like Sense by itself is an incomplete product because it can only do diagnostics. It can't really do uh, controls. And, you know, so my utility has a variable electric rate structure. So for 10% of the month, my electric rate quadruples. And then for 90% of the month, my electric rate goes down by half. So right off the bat, that should be, uh, you know, uh, 40% plus 45%, you know, about a 5% cost savings. Uh, But I use home, you know, it's not just the energy monitor. It's the, I use the energy monitor and the thermostat to, you know, say, turn off my air conditioning during these peak hours mm-hmm. and then turn it right. right back on again as soon as it's over. And so I do that with my refrigerator. I do that with my dehumidifier. Um, and so with a couple of smart plugs, and AOTech makes a 40 amp, uh, 240 volt 
controller as well. So you can do it with your electric water heater. You can pretty uh -huh. much kill all of your, you know, non critical electricity and start kind of shoving it around to fit an electric rate structure. And so there's, there's more than just like geofencing for, you know, turning off your devices when you're away and turning them back on again when you're home. You know, when you're actively at home, if you right. have one of these like unconventional electric rate structures, you can kind of start pushing your electricity around to to shape it into, you know, how you're actually being built. And that's quite valuable, not just at the residential level, but at the commercial level uh, as well. And so if we can make these systems more economic, then we can kind of drive up the adoption rates of the of the platform. Oh, absolutely. It's really cool as well for like in terms of green, like being green, right? Like removing greenhouse emissions and all that. Like the more money you're saving, the less, you know, CO2 emissions you're producing as well. So I guess there's a, a green angle as well. You could. Yeah. For sure. Well. well, so the, the, where in the solar universe, where uh, kind of smart home automation companies are looking at is managing your electricity uh, during a power outage. And my off-grid customer has the, a similar challenge uh, just as a full-time challenge, not just <laughs> not just in an emergency mode, where that like the, the Tesla power wall is does not output enough instantaneous power to power a whole house. Like it could right. power your air conditioner and that's it and nothing else. Or it could power you know, some, some critical loads, but not your air conditioner, which, you know, being on the Gulf coast, United States, you know, the last thing I would want to lose is my air conditioner, you know, yeah. spoil all the food in the fridge, give me that AC. Um, and so what, what you can do with home assistant is prioritize your electrical devices so that they don't run when the air conditioner is running. And so in this off grid house, we have the, we have two electric water tanks and they kind of get in line with each other and they don't turn on except when the home air conditioner system is not in use. And that allows us to power a lot more devices on the same uh, output capacity. And so whether it's a Tesla power wall in a backup emergency management mode where now you can run the whole house instead of just running a handful of appliances or if you're kind of in a more specialized market like solar where you need to do some energy management, you know, home assistant is, is a, a very accessible and easy way to program these energy automations uh, in, in ways that I don't know, I've been in the solar industry for 10 years and I haven't been able to put this together in, in such a responsive means. Right. So, so like in the off grid home, as soon as her energy meter reads above 10 kilowatts, it'll start cutting power to her non essential loads so that the, you know, less controllable loads can, can occupy up the full bandwidth. And then when they drop back down again, the non critical loads turn back on. That's really cool. And all this is powered inside Home Assistant? Yeah, like it's, through it's all powered or... inside Home Assistant. Um, just through their automations editor, so automations.yaml, I, I suppose. Yeah, but, yep. uh, and, and sometimes to simplify that process, I'll write a script and put all the devices into the script and then just the automation triggers the script uh, to kind of simplify things because there's a lot of different devices that you'd want to turn on or off uh, theoretically. Yeah, I can imagine. You know, the way I look at it is the utility is kind of the ultimate cloud service because, you know, your power company is doing all the processing of your electricity offsite before delivering it to you. You know, they're charging you a subscription fee. You stop paying it. You lose all uh, <laughs> access to all your devices. And they, they know a lot about you, uh, but we find it acceptable for the service they provide. And maybe the, the local equivalent of solar and batteries is a little bit costlier and maybe not quite as good as that that grid tied connection. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, no, that, that that's actually really cool. So it, it's interesting because I don't think we've ever taken a solar or electric approach kind of on the show. So uh, I I think it's a great starting point because all yeah. of the the doorbells and light bulbs and switches 
are fun and exciting and, and maybe more desirable, but they're not necessarily economic. Um, whereas if you're a, a business and you're, you're, it can be 70 or 80% of your bill is not through energy, but through demand charges. So here in Mississippi, we have dirt cheap electricity pricing, but we have New York City demand charge pricing. And if I can, if I'm a hotel owner and I can turn mm -hmm. off, um, you know, a window unit or a wall unit or even a vending machine for just 15 minutes of my peak demand, you know, that can result in tremendous economic payback. And so I'm kind of really interested in, in how can we make smart home systems more economic. And so right. starting with energy controls and then adding on, you know, the, the rest of the, you know, future modernism is nice. You know, that it actually made me think of an argument in defense of Z-Wave rather than Wi-Fi, uh, which is kind of interesting in that, uh, you know, you can program all of these Z-Wave devices off-site and ship them to sites so that they work out of the box. So you could program a home assistant build and then put it in a box and ship it and then unpack it without, you know, so now you have wireless communication occurring right out of the box without any on-site programming, without even needing the, you know, access to the customer's internet. Because they're so, all paired and ready um, to go. That's right. Now you, you have to have some expertise on how to do that because of the, the routing hops that the Z-Wave gets to it. So you, have, you would have to emulate kind of where the location of these devices are going to be in the house when you're, when you're pairing to not get it kind of tangled. But yeah, you can do a lot of remote setup before uh, shipping to site. Okay. Wow. Although, you know, from, from, a, from a builder perspective, there was a lot of learning curves to this because we did on the, on the high end home, we did abode as a security hub. And then we also had a lot of just Z wave plus AOTech devices. And you know, so we got to get into the, the, the brass tacks of, you know, abode using a proprietary 2.4 gigahertz frequency and, you know, Z wave, you know, doing their own kind of 900 megahertz frequency. And, yeah. and I got to say the abode sensors, even though they, they cost more money and they were at that higher frequency. So you think, Oh, you know, worse battery life. It's just, they worked so much better than the AOTech Z wave in terms of just responsiveness and build quality. And so, you know, from a, from a technical standpoint, it really made me think, you know, hey, with a security sensor, you know, might you want a little more energy, a little bit higher performance. You might want to spend a little bit more on, you know, perimeter security sensors than on, you know, the same kind of sensor that was less critical inside your home. So there's, you know, approaching Home Assistant as a as a builder or contractor, you get into to different kinds of, of product selection issues that maybe a home hobbyist wouldn't really uh, consider. That's, That's interesting. So w when you're using something like Abode, Home Assistant, whatever, what's what's some of the criteria that like. Why, why would you choose one over the other? Yeah, so yeah, I started with Z-Wave just to simplify things. You know, when you're yeah. buying a Z-Wave product, you already know it's going to be relatively open and, um, you know, relatively intelligent within the yeah. context of Home Assistant. So there's no guesswork involved. Like, you know, the, the smart Wi-Fi products... I don't know if I actually will be able to access them in the ways I want to access them, having never you know used them before. Um, Abode kind of threw me for a loop a little bit because it's advertised as a Z-Wave Plus hub, but they have to you know take the third-party Z-Wave Plus devices and officially support them, and if they don't and they don't pair up with the hub correctly you really just have to sit around and wait for them to update it. So, you know, from a, from a home assistant perspective, I want everything to be within home assistant, but from the homeowner perspective, if they're a homeowner who's paying for third party security services, then most likely they want their 
uh, security related smart devices paired to that security hub. So in our case, pairing right. everything to Abode and then bring it in, in to Home Assistant. And not all the the data, especially with third party devices, uh, makes all the the Battlestar jumps from one hub to the next. So we lose out on our our smoke alarm and carbon monoxide sensing and home assistant because that got paired directly to a boat and it didn't get migrated <sighs> all the way through. Or like with your schlange locks, you know, you can pair them to a security hub and it makes sense to have your your locks paired to your security device, but then you lose out on the nice packages that you can install to you know, change key codes and stuff on the fly in Home Assistant. So um, in in general, I like Home Assistant a lot better as just the end-all home base intelligent hub, um, although that's not necessarily in line with, you know, consumer enterprise-grade, say, security systems at this time. I'd, I'd love Nabucasa to offer a, a third-party security service so that I don't really need to uh, have a security hub within my, you know, smart home ecosystem. It's another point of failure, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I do like the. It, it made me think that like Z-Wave is not inherently better than a Wi-Fi sensor. You know that that point-to-point communication for the. Uh, abode security sensors the the difference is is i found to be readily apparent and instantaneous in terms of what is easier and more responsive right out of the box so at least in in my line of thinking i think like you know limiting the z-wave network to say i'm only going to use z-wave for like thermostat and energy monitoring and energy related stuff and then, uh, you know, not necessarily seek out things like Z-Wave light bulbs or Z-Wave everything. You know, I, I'm not married to Z-Wave, but I think it does have a point. And, you know, to, to me, that point is pre-packaging. You know, how much of a entry-level smart home product can you put onto a Z-Wave network and ship out the door and then let the, the user, you know, kind of deal with Wi-Fi products as the add-ons, I think is a pretty good strategy. Yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. So when you're designing or when you're thinking about all these things, are you, when you're setting up Home Assistant at least, uh, are you using a lot of graphs to try and work out what's using the most energy or are you basically just deciding what are the high energy use products in the home for example you know i know for a fact that the fridge is going to be high use i know that this you know the the hvac is going to be high use so i'll target only those areas or are you just you're just going on those gut feels alone yeah i mean you right off the bat it's easy to identify which are going to be your heavy use devices and then which of those devices are even worth controlling like if you have an electric oven you know there's not much you can do other than use it or not use it so yep. um you know you can be aware of what time you're going to use it but are you actually going to control that and then, you know same thing with like your clothes washer and dryer they'll often have features now where you can put a delay on it so if you do have one of these crazy rate structures do you need you know additional in- intelligence applied to that yeah. for controls you know not necessarily but i do have a, a dehumidifier being on the gulf coast that's running 24 7 and and actually the hard part of the product selection is finding the a device that's dumb enough to be controlled through a smart plug yeah. so that when the smart plug loses power the device loses power and when the smart plug turns back on the device turns back on but the smart plugs that i use you know are energy sensing and so if i plug it into my dehumidifier and then i actually look <laughs> at the device level data and and say okay well that doesn't use as much power as i thought I can just rotate it to the next device and rotate it to the next device. But it's like, you know, your, your thermostat is the major one. And then if you can identify, you know, three or four appliances that you can, you can 
take offline during peak time and then reconnect, you know, as soon as peak time's over, then all of a sudden you can really start pushing your electricity around. And, and that might mean just, you know, you could do really granular level controls by getting in and setting thermostat step, set points, or you could just take a more binary approach and say, okay, well, I'm going to just turn off my whole system. And then if I can't take it anymore, you know, turn it back on for 15 minutes. And then as soon as no more, as soon as the AC cycles back off, kill it the rest of the time. Like you can do, you know, tiered steps. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, in my case, I was able to get, you know, 10% of my hours by my utility are considered peak hours and only 3% of my electric usage is now being used during that peak time. A lot of it's lifestyle change, but it's also I have the the home assistant build kind of there playing free safety. What I was what I was really, you know, more challenged by is is product selection of things not being compatible when I would get outside the home assistant ecosystem and then try and bring it back in. Um, so like with Abode, uh, the it's being a Z-Wave Plus hub, but it was not compatible with my Z-Wave Plus Schwange door locks. And so, you know, I, w- I got into this weird conundrum of, you know, do I program all my devices into Home Assistant and then try and feed them back into the security hub, which doesn't always uh, work as far as triggering the alarm, um, or do I just wait for product updates? And, uh, you know, that was the same thing with even like with Unifi with their video cameras, because they, they went from a uh, Unifi video to Unifi protect and got rid of their API, uh, in the process. And so it's been kind of interesting just waiting for, you know, now there's a hacks, uh, solution for Unifi protect that is, is functioning on my build. Uh, but it's been kind of thrilling to, to to have solutions that you get to the field and there's a problem because the products aren't compatible and then you wait a few months and then all of a sudden the products are compatible. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I always feel relieved when that happens. Yeah, that's fair. So what are your thoughts on uh, like devices that are taking phantom power, for example, you know, like Hue light bulbs or LifeX light bulbs that are constantly on on that standby power. Are you trying to avoid those as well? I guess you said wave devices would have a lot of that as well. Yeah, not really because I'm not, I, I just am not concerned about, you know, phantom power, which might be a five watt load uh, or less for a, a major device that might be using 4,000 watts when it's on. Um, yep. So I'm not, I'm not too, you know, I'm trying to go after, you know, the, the real issues at hand, not um, stuff you can't do anything about. And, you know, that, that light bulb that's always on, you know, there, A, there is a, a way around that, which is to do the controller switch is inside the wall. But, uh, that solution is often less cost effective than just you know putting the light bulb up there. So I you know you just take what you can get. The the in the wall behind the control box solutions, you know I have found that they can be a lot easier uh, than you think. Where it, you just have to have the right electrical knowledge. Like if you, you know, instead of trying to connect the wall wires directly into the port of the controller you know, putting whips of cable with, with wire lugs inside the box and, and thinking about where all those tiny wires are actually going to line up inside the box. So when you place the controller into it, it, it lines up a little bit easier rather than having to fight the wires that are already in there, you know, popping out of the terminals when you're trying to squeeze the thing back through into that tiny space. But ultimately, I don't like wiring those behind the controller light switches. I'd rather use you know, like the GE approach, which is a full light switch replacement. And then for the smart bulbs, um, you know, if you're not so technical, the funny thing is the, the behind the, the light switch replacements, the wiring involved takes a lot of time and the yeah. light bulb approach doesn't. And so, you know, if you have to go in the, you know, the low end solution would be to, you know, tape your light switch into an always on position. So no one turns it off and put that light bulb in the fan. 
And even though these $15 to $30 light bulbs can seem quite pricey, you compare that to, you know, the the time that it'll take to actually rewire light switch and figure out if it's a two-way or three-way or four-way switch and figure out where the neutral comes in and 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 then figure out how to get all those tedious little wires um, installed in a competent manner. You know, that's that's where the, the cost is. You compare that to your $15 light bulb and you're like, why didn't I just pay for the expensive light bulb to begin with? Yeah. So, so how do you, when, especially when you're doing professional installs, then how do you, how do you tackle that? Like from a, specifically from a user experience perspective. So, um, now, especially if I'm, if I'm automating my house and especially if I'm paying somebody to automate my house, the assumption is I, I'm used to a certain way of, um, doing things, whether uh, it's turn on and turn off lights or, or whatever. So how do you, how do you get around that? Well, I, uh, you know, initially in my first project was a new build and I thought that that would make things a lot easier. Um, and in some ways new construction is a lot easier because you can, you know, pull ethernet cable through walls, but at the same time, you can't, you know, if you don't have internet access already out at your house, you know, you can't really start testing out (laughs) the systems you're installing uh, so well. And so, um, and it's, it's high end expensive components and you don't want to, you know, install it into a a shell of a home that's not complete yet, or that has, you know, tons of people in and out of it on a daily basis. So it, it actually required a lot more coordination and going to the site afterwards for, you know, finishing than, than what I anticipated. And so, you know, that's where I come back to looking at, at Z wave and saying like, man, what, you know, the only way that this stuff could be rolled out commercially is doing as much pre-programming as you can so that you're not just spending your time, you know, running up and down the stairs, you know, sure, for sure. the entire day. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that can get the, that can get really get you when you're like, okay, well, if I'm installing a smart hub, you know, down in the server room and it's a build big giant server. And then it comes time to pair your smart locks and they say, Oh, well, this is a secure pairing mode. The devices need to be right next to each other in order to pair. And so now you're taking the locks off of the doors and running them down to the basement and moving them back up. But then that messes with how they communicate across the Z wave mesh, you know, it just gets, it gets complicated. So, you know, I'd, I'd say, you know, pay in, in my future projects, I'm paying a lot more attention to, you know, how much of this stuff can be pre-assembled and pre-programmed before making it out to the job site in order to get the install to go more, you know, quickly. That's fair enough. You know, I use uh, Grafana and InfluxDB for energy visualization. But what you know, what I found is that energy visualization to me is less important than the energy controls. And sure. what's what's also interesting is the energy controls do not take much processing power or technical capability. I mean, if most of the most of the communications occurring on that Z-wave radio, and um, you know the Raspberry Pi is is just kind of a, a manager of that. When you get into data logging. Um, now you have to get into, you know, well, how much memory does my controller have? Does it really have a processing speed, uh, to be running these, uh, in a, a user friendly manner. So it, it's kind of easier to make a cheaper device with less capability. And, and when you, when you start adding the cost to, to add more feature sets, it starts to become a little less cost effective and a little more high end. So by, by the time you get, to like sense it's an energy monitor with really good software behind it, but it's expensive. And all it does is let you look at your electricity. You know, you can, you can do a a smaller build uh, that has less, you know, uh, of a feature rich, you know, user environment, but actually does more stuff. So, you know, if you're a home assistant user, I think it is absolutely worthwhile to go onto your utility website and start looking for different electric rate structures to say, you know, hey, can my home assistant build, you know, actually save me money 
not just through like the the kind of dog and pony show of you know oh I'm leaving my house so I'm going to lower my thermostat and save a bunch of money well I work from home so I'm you know mm-hmm. I'm home a lot and when I'm not home my roommate's home so we don't really have uh, a situation the benefit from geofencing but the the real opportunity is the benefit from alternative rate structures and you know the what I was just real surprised with was how much out of the box capability home assistant has with these energy meters you know as soon as you start collecting that data it shows up as an available automation and within home assistant i think the only thing holding back the energy meter side is you do have to have a little bit of electrician skills so that you're not you know intimidated by work behind an electric service panel which of course is a, a dangerous uh, place to be in your home. Yeah, exactly. And that's those are things you definitely want to get a professional most times, right? Uh, unless you're that comfortable. But see, I'm a I'm a solar installer, and yeah. I, there's there's a good at least in the U.S. a good solar uh, installer uh, network. Uh, there's a certificate called NABCEP, and so as a solar installer. You know, if I can sell things that are not on the rooftop, that are inside where the air conditioning is, and that benefit my, you know, existing trade, you know, that's just, there's no downside to that. And so yeah. selling, you know, more intelligent monitoring systems is already happening in the solar industry. And so it begs the question well, why not have the solar monitor uh, also do your home energy management? And Home Assistant is a great entry point for that. Yeah, that sounds really exciting and really awesome. I can't wait to see where you're gonna, how far you're going to take this because I think this is a, a really good use case for Home Assistant. It also allows more people to get involved in, in having the Home Assistant in more homes. So it's really cool. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and there's, there's companies out there like Powerly and Lumen um, that are kind of focused on uh, smart energy management, where but like Lumen is doing it by managing your entire service panel, whereas Home Assistant lets you surgically kind of hone in on you know exactly what devices need to be monitored. Like you don't need to know what every single light bulb in your house is using in terms of energy. That's just going to be too much data sure. for you to do anything with. Um, but being able to know, you know, being able, and you don't even need to monitor things like your air conditioner, you know, a load that is so obvious when it's occurring that in, and really other than adjust your thermostat settings, there's not much you can do about it. Um, you, you kind of have to work around those kinds of loads. Uh, so your, your major loads, you're going to be able to identify and, and manage, uh, and, you know, not sweat the small stuff, I'd say, mm-hmm. you know, uh, let's see some other technology we used on the house. We did, we did Sonos, which, you know, the Sonos and the Z wave devices had a lesson learned for me, which is just because the device says it's battery powered or wireless does not mean that it should be battery powered or wireless. And so, you know, that was, that was kind of one mistake that I made out of the box with my Z-Wave install. I thought yeah. oh, Z-Wave is great for wireless device communication. And so I'm going to have, you know, wireless multi-sensors and wireless door sensors and wireless, uh, you know, door locks and, and, you know, my mistake was my, on my initial build, I did wireless everything. Right. And it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> because nothing was repeating. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's also that many things you got to replace when it dies, right? Or uh, batteries wise. Yeah, right. And yeah, the battery management is an issue, but but with the lack of repeater stations was a big issue. And, you know, with Sonos, you know, they have an Ethernet on port on every one of their speakers. And so in our... Smart home, you know, we were doing TV over Ethernet, you know, bringing cable boxes from the the interior of the home up to each TV in the house. Yeah. And then we had, you know, Sonos speakers on each TV in the house. Well, then there's the, you know, Ethernet port on the television for each TV in the house. And so it's all of a sudden for each media station, you really need three Ethernet runs to every, you know, home theater central television station in the house to optimize it for your your 
power over Ethernet TV controls, plus your Sonos controls, mm-hmm. um, plus your Ethernet over television, if that's how you're going to go. And so that, I mean, that was surprising. I, as a, you know, going into it, I would not have imagined that, you know, the, the best way to do a, a wired Ethernet approach is to put e- three Ethernet connections to every kind of home feeder station in, in the house. It just seemed ridiculous to me at the time. But if you don't do that, then you start getting into reliance upon these wireless networks, which is not as, as good. Right. And, and even with Sonos, you know, if you don't have one hardwired speaker, then their wireless network doesn't get set up correctly. And so, you know, I, I learned to embrace hardwired devices and I've, you know, come to believe that every device that can be hardwired should be. No, that's right. fair enough. I mean, I think, I think there's a good uh, use case behind there. Totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. And we also put a, a UPS on the off-grid home, which is kind of weird because it's already a battery-powered home. But backing up the whole server on a UPS allows us to do things like power down the building for maintenance and, and servicing without uh, taking down the, the Ethernet. And so that really got me excited about other powered-over Ethernet devices in terms of backup power capability. And it's like, wow, I'd really love to do power over Ethernet lighting. I think power over Ethernet uh, window shades is like the one thing that builders are are nowhere near thinking about, but could become absolutely essential because you think about, you know, the power demands on window shade motors uh, yep. and the level of precise control you really want out of a window shade device. And the fact that there's no, you know, good way to bring power out to existing windows like even if you're not planning on doing powered window shades at this time, you know, running Ethernet to every window in the house, I, I think is valuable. And I don't think builders are thinking about that right now. So there's a, a big frontier in smart home uh, design. And I think the reward is is real good because if you can come in and master, you know, smart home design and build, you know, now you're selling the person every single light switch in their their home. Yeah. Well, it's it's interesting. Commercial installations, I think now they are thinking more about things like window shades and stuff. Um, I know in 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 the office I work at, uh, they they actually have PoE window shades, PoE lights, PoE so on and so forth. Right. So I, th- I do think it's becoming more prevalent. Whether it's there or not in the masses, you know, I think I think. I don't think it's there yet, but I think in like proof of concepts and stuff like that, I think uh, I think they're going somewhere with it. I think uh, uh, lastly, you know, for for me, um, while level is kind of my foray into home assistant builds, I'm I'm primarily a solar installer, and I do offer a free solar education on my website, community dot solar. So it's a dot solar instead of a dot com. So if people want to learn about, you know, the principles of off-grid design or designing a rooftop solar array for their home uh, so that they don't just have to do local energy controls, but they can also do local energy uh, generation. If they just head over to www.community.solar, we got some really good learning uh, classes available to help you start figuring that out for your home or business. It's all free. That's awesome. And of course, we'll leave... We'll leave links in the show notes as well, just in case people want to click on that easily. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, be that's awesome. Hobby. Yeah, yeah. I I'm hoping to blog about it and show more data about what we're doing and and kind of lead by example uh, for that. So I'm I'm pretty excited about it. I mean, uh, it's like the the Tesla Powerwall or you know solar being able to save a few dollars a day, but cost tens of thousands. Whereas, you know, energy controls, you know, can be had for under a thousand dollars and can save, you know, maybe not a hundred percent of the bill, but 20 to 30% of the bill. Uh, in some cases, that's, I think that that's great. And that should be the starting point rather than the, the, you know, done after the fact. Absolutely. Like, I don't know the, the one thing that, solar has a problem of is if you don't have storage the electricity outflows onto the electric grid so sometimes the utility doesn't 
buy that back at the same price as what they charge you for your electricity. So just being able to get a you know refrigerator to operate more during the day and less at night is a, a cost effective upgrade and that can be accomplished with a ten dollar you know Wi-Fi smart plug. So uh, there's solutions out there that Home Assistant is creating that um, could be very valuable to people who aren't currently uh, using smart home technology inside their house. No, totally. Awesome. Well, John, thank you so much for joining us. I think uh, we've had some really cool insights today. Yeah, you're welcome. I'll, I'll talk to you guys later. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Awesome. Cheers. Thanks a lot. If you want to share your home assistant journey or come on as a guest, reach out to us at feedback at haspodcast.io. That's H-A-S-S podcast.io. The Home Assistant Podcast is hosted by Phil Hawthorne and myself, Rohan Karamandi. For links to topics that we discussed today, check out our show notes on haspodcast.io.